And now look to Professor Padraig O'Malley to continue the case for the proposition. Here, here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sherbourne. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for coming here this evening. We have already heard great eloquence on both against two states and uh, for two states, and it's a tribute to the, to the history of the society going back to 1823 that it had the tradition of producing such eloquence. Now, let's get down to business. According to a poll conducted by the Palestinian Center for Policy and Research Survey in December 2015, two-thirds of Palestinians back violence against Israel, including the current trend of stabbings. Two-thirds want Abbas out of office, and two-thirds reject a two-state solution. But 70% also reject a one-state solution where they would have equal rights with Israelis. As to Israel's attention, intentions for the Temple Mount Al-Aqsa Mosque, 55% of Palestinians believe that Israel intends to destroy the mosque and build a third temple in its place. 41% believe that Israel, as Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Nahahu stated repeatedly that he's interested in maintaining the status quo, 41% do not believe him. On the other hand, a majority of Jews want to pray on Temple Mount. And if Jews were ever to pray on Temple Mount, you no longer just have a conflict between Israel and Palestine, you have a conflict between Israel and the entire Muslim world. 42% of Israelis, for Israeli Jews, I'll just use Israeli rather than Israeli Jews as I go on. 42% support a resumption of negotiations, but only if the Palestinians recognize Israel as a Jewish state beforehand, something of which the Palestinians cannot do because it would, it would attenuate and vitiate its entire narrative of history. 62% agree with Mr. Netanyahu's statement that Palestinian terrorism is no different than world terrorism and that both come from the same sources. Both Palestinians and Israelis believe that they cannot peacefully live together in two states. So who's for two states? Well, the Americans are, the French are, the Germans are, but the two people most closely involved, Palestinians and, and, and Israelis, say we can't live together peacefully. They're not saying how they can live together peacefully, but they are saying we cannot live peacefully under two states. You know, 58% of Israeli Jews believe that Mr. Netanyahu is not tough enough on Palestinians. That 20 year sentence for throwing rocks on teenagers, that destroying the homes of Palestinians when they are arrested on a terrorist charge, for allowing the IDF to shoot a Palestinian if he or she should make the slightest movement towards attempting to pick something out of their pocket, even if it was only a handkerchief. You know, in all of the stabbings and all that we've heard in the last year and a half, the odd thing is that in poll after poll, it's the Palestinians who are more fearful of the IDF than Israelis are fearful of the Palestinians. 28% of Israeli Jews believe that holding or beginning negotiations once again is the state's priority. Just 28%. In the last election, in the run-up to it, just 9% of Israelis listed 
peace with Palestinians as their own personal priority in that election. 40% said they feared poverty. That's one set of facts, or one set of context for a starting point. But there are many contexts that you could take. The fact is, you can take anything, any starting point, and move in startlingly different directions at the turn of a pen. You can customize the contradictions, reach diametrically opposing conclusions at the flick of a history book, and squeeze the narratives into forms of deceitful consensus. You could drive wedges into the interpretation of any event, past, present, or even events that will happen in the future but have not yet happened. You could passionately advocate as fact any proposition without a shred of evidence to back it up. You could take history by the scruff of the neck, shake the living daylights out of it until you reconfigure it into the narrative of your choice. You can engage in endless charades of under-the-table negotiations, over-the-table negotiations, theatrics. You can, in fact, become a Donald Trump. <laughs> Which brings me to some of the major reasons why a two-state solution with 1967 borders and East Jerusalem as the capital of a Palestinian state is simply not on any longer. It is not to say that it would have been possible at some point in the past, but facts on the ground have changed significantly since Mr. Netanyahu took power in 2008, and even more significantly since 2000. First, there's a question of leadership. For any resolution of this conflict, you must have leaders on both sides that are transformational. Leaders who can lift their people to a larger vision than the people they sell and hold, that they can bring the people with them. On both sides, Israeli and Palestinians, there is not just an absence of leadership. Both leaders President Netanyahu and President Abbas accused the other of inciting hate. Both accused them of inciting violence. Both accused the other of always not being in good faith. Both accusing the other of someone who cannot be trusted. And I assure you that in the era of Netanyahu and Abbas, there will be perhaps some negotiations which Mr. Netanyahu needs because he wants to still to have American support, but as all the other negotiations, they will lead nowhere. Two, Abbas. Mr. Abbas is an aging autocrat. Two thirds of his own people want him to resign. Yet, when he goes abroad, He's treated as though he were the head of state. The red carpets are rolled out. He speaks on the podium of the United Nations. And he's delivered nothing to his people during his tenure as president. Indeed, he even lacks legitimacy since the last elections in Palestine were in the year 2005. No election since. The Palestinian Authority ranks highly on the list of lack of transparency, of corruption. People in the West Bank, Palestinians in the West Bank, are afraid to speak their mind. There's no succession process in place. Fatah is a party that has only had two leaders, Yasser Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas. Abbas is 80 years of old. Candidates are lining up behind him to take over his position, but there is no succession route in place. And Fatah is famous for its faction infighting. And these factions have lined up each with their own candidate, and when 
Mr. Abbas does depart the scene, there would be a vicious contest to succeed him, one that could very easily end up in violence or one that could see the end or splitting of Hamas itself. So there's no Palestinian consensus in the West Bank for anything except to end the occupation. Oslo. The Oslo Agreements of 1993 and 1995 at the framework for negotiations were obsolete almost from the time they were signed because they did not provide or understand or see the threat of Hamas and that Hamas was there to destroy the Oslo Agreements and Hamas has destroyed the Oslo Agreements. And how did the people, how did the people of Palestine reward Hamas? They rewarded them by allowing them to win the only election held in the West Bank in 2005, when Fatah got more seats for the legislature than did Fatah. Negotiations. I'm there already? They, they seem to go on quite long. Already, <laughs> no? Okay. Let me get down to it. <laughs> Quickly. Take, I want you to think this way. That in the Gaza war, Israel fired about 2,000, killed 2,022 people. On the Israeli side, 13 people were killed, seven civilians and six members of the defense forces, which was treated as an abnormal source of grief in Israel itself because Israelis believe believe that they, they sanctify life more than the Palestinians. Now, what did Israel learn from that war? It learned that it can, it can contain the conflict as long as it keeps Hamas in the West Bank. That means they can have another war every three or four years, and this thing can be repeated. They had wars in 2008 9, 2012, 2014. You probably have one before 2017. But on the Israeli side, it is containable. Now, let's say we had an agreement. That means Hamas would have to decommission its arms. Do you think Hamas would decommission its arms? Do you think Israelis would believe that Hamas had, conditions, had got rid of its arms? Do you believe Israel that this would happen when they would have no idea of what the scale and magnitude and inventory of the weapons are? And in the Middle East, you can get rearming by just sending out your your order overnight and they'll arrive the following day on a drone. Rocket launchers, missiles. But if Hamas got into the West Bank, you have an entirely different situation. You have one in which Hamas can fire rockets at Israel on mobile launchers from any distance and hit any target in Israel, any population center within a hundred miles and no iron drone or iron dome has the capacity to stop those missiles. One of Israel's negotiators over the years is General Michael Herzog and he told me in an interview that Israel would never allow Hamas to be in the West Bank. Any two states requires Gaza being taken out of its, of the prison it has existed in for the last seven years. And it allows freedom of movement between the two parts. Professor, Professor O'Malley, could I, could I please ask you to come to your closing remarks? Do I have a minute? One minute, thank you. One minute. 
You know, the Israeli mindset just shifted from what it was on the Iranian or the, Amer or the Israeli mindset. When the P5 plus 1 a nuclear agreement was being signed with Iran, all Israelis said, you cannot trust the Iranians, they are liars, they cheat, they're manipulative, they out negotiate you, they find a way to break this agreement or get around its provisions. That's the exact mindset it has when it comes to the Palestinians. They lie, they cheat, they manipulate, they are cunning. My final statement, which fits in, I hope, to what I have said. General Gadi Eisenkot, the chief of staff of the IDF, said, no soldier should waste a cartridge firing into a 13-year-old Palestinians with a pair of scissors. 58% of Israelis disagreed with the chief of staff. And at the kernel of this conflict now, because it's not the same conflict as it was in 2000 or in 2010 or 2014, this is a conflict where hatred has taken root in both Palestine and Israel. And to talk of two states any time in the future is simply not looking at the realities that exist on the ground. Thank you.